Joining me right now, back on the program, Joan McCarter, who joins us often, senior political writer at Daily Coast, covers uh, Washington, Capitol Hill, of course, uh, everything going on or not going on. So <laughs> we have a lot to get into. Welcome back to the program, Joan. Oh, hi, Michael. It's good to be here. So before we get into some of what's happening on Capitol Hill, I, I wanted to get your take and, and talk about this new piece by Barton Gelman in The Atlantic. Uh, he had written a piece before the 2020 election that pretty much predicted um, what might happen, what would happen regarding January 6th, or at least the denial of uh, the winner of the vote, the big lie. Uh, it was all right there. And he's now written uh, a new piece, and you tweeted about it three times. So that is an indication to me of how it is uh, something we need to pay <laughs> big uh, attention to. It's uh, titled, Trump's Next Coup Has Already Begun. Talk a little bit about it. They're not being, they being Republicans, particularly um, discreet <laughs> in saying that, yeah, they're laying the groundwork for the next coup. We're seeing it in state after state after state where they are passing um, increasingly egregious legislation to keep people from voting, um, to overturn the results of the election by taking over various elections boards in key counties and by just allowing the big lie to continue to fester at pretty much every level of the Republican Party. So um, Gelman was prescient in 2020. He's prescient now. And I really wish more of the traditional media was paying attention to that. Yeah, it's, you know, we just had white supremacists marching in Washington uh, over the weekend at the Lincoln Memorial. And I don't remember seeing anything about it in the media. But, you know, all I see are incredibly uh, laudatory uh, um, look backs on Bob Dole's career <laughs> that are going right. on for day two days now. <laughs> right. Yeah, I didn't see anything about that, the march in D.C. by the the fascists either. Um, Neo-Nazis, yeah. fascists, white supremacists, whatever we want to call them, it's all one and the same at this point. Um, no, I saw a lot about it on Twitter, but I, I didn't see yeah. anything on certainly national news broadcasts. No. And, and, and yeah, I, I hope that... Uh, and, and and the Democrats, too, I hope that they see, because Gelman makes the point in the article that it's all there and Democrats are, are not taking it seriously. There's sometimes some strong rhetoric by the president and others, but they're not doing what needs to be done. They're not doing what needs to be done. And you just get this feeling that there's complacency that there's, well, our institutions are strong enough. They can withhold all of this. We don't really need to worry about it. It'll all blow over. And look what happened on January 6th. Yeah. Look where we are right now. Complacency yeah. is the last thing that the nation can afford. So I, I, I don't know what it's going to take to break through. I'm, I'm hoping Gelman and his story sort of pick up speed. But I've, you know, I've seen some poo-pooing of it from other pundit types saying, oh, well, yeah, it's not all that bad. And, you know, this is being inflammatory. Don't, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. The institution oh, yeah. will hold. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, our institutions are, are not going to be capable of holding, um, Another well, even Ross uh, Ross Douthat at the New York Times actually was able to spin out a, 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 an op, a, an opinion piece that said that Gelman's original story never even came true because the country still held together or something like that. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> never mind that little you know insurrection at the Capitol and yeah. the people who died. <laughs> yeah. 
So uh, some of the issues you focus in on uh, that people need to hear about. Um, the shutdown uh, story was rather amazingly quick. Um, we were facing a government shutdown and it suddenly it got Un, you know, it 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 didn't happen, uh, but as you say, <laughs> yeah, it it just you know the Republicans, uh, you know, were able to overcome the crazies and got it done, I guess. Um, but they you blinked. say, we're, yeah, sort yeah, of. Yes, it, it you was say very. It was strange. Go on. It was strange. Well, talk a little bit about that, and then you say we're out of the shutdown frying pan and into the debt ceiling fire. Yes. <laughs> One of the things that I think both of these things show right now, we've got we, we got McConnell through the government shutdown threat from his extremists through rather creative means. And it looks like he's trying to do the same thing with debt ceiling. Um, with the government shutdown, they had the handful Cruz, Mike Lee, um, Sherman. Was, is that his name? He's new. <laughs> oh, Marshall. Oh, Marshall. A Marshall, the guy <laughs> in Kansas. I don't know where Kansas. Jeremy came from. Marshall, yeah. 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 All saying, no, we, you know, we have to shut down government over vaccine mandates and we are not going to vote for government to stay open. And House Republicans were sort of, well, yeah, OK, we'll, we'll do that. <laughs> and how the Senate figured out how to get through their insistence upon doing this was to give them an amendment to the government shutdown, or to the government funding bill, rather, saying, okay, we, we don't want any vaccine mandates. But they assured that that couldn't pass <laughs> by sending two Republican senators out of town so that they only had 48 votes, <laughs> which, <laughs> you know, it's, it's kind of a ridiculous length to go to, but it worked. They didn't have the votes to pass it, so they mm -hmm. were safe in having the vote and not shutting government down. And nobody could look at Republicans and say, look what they did again. Um, and I think McConnell's trying to kind of do the same thing with debt ceiling, working with Schumer remarkably to figure out a way around this to keep everybody happy. Um, how the outlines of this are going to look, I don't know yet. They're still trying to figure out some way they can put language in the defense authorization bill that will somehow allow the Senate to pass debt ceiling hike or suspension or however they decide to do it um, with just a simple majority vote. How that language works, I don't know. But the fact that McConnell is really going out of his way to figure out how not to have this fight might tell you that he is really concerned that if he pushes too far, the Democrats will get rid of the filibuster, that that he'll go a bridge too far even for Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema. And they'll go along with the rest of the Democrats in getting rid of the filibuster because it's something as important as raising the debt ceiling. That's my hunch. I don't know if it's true, but I don't see another reason for McConnell to all of a sudden be helpful. Right. And it, it, it also shows that McConnell, this narrative gets written around him by the media that he always wins, he always gets his way, he always outsmarts everybody. And it's not always true. But when it's not true, they just kind of forget that part. And, you know, if you do stand up uh, and do take him on, uh, there are things he's afraid of. And so he will go along. That's my sense. Um, he, he did not do well in the last debt ceiling fight when he said, no, we're not going to do it. We're not going to do it. We're not going to do it. You're going to have to do it on your own. And Schumer didn't listen. <laughs> and, and yeah, McConnell ended up folding. They only got a th three month, three month extension of the debt ceiling through that. But McConnell did end up having to cave and took a lot of flack within his caucus for doing so. 
So he didn't want to be put in that position again. But the problem is, you know, saving face right after that, he and 46 other members of the Republican caucus sent a letter to Biden saying, you're going to have to do this on your own next time. We're not going to be there next time. Well, now it's next time. (laughs) And he doesn't want to be responsible but he also wants to figure out a way that he doesn't break that promise that there aren't right. Republican votes for it. So right. he he, he kind of tied himself up in knots there um, and appears to be working hard to to untie those knots. We'll see what happens this week. Now, that's a big challenge, uh, certainly for the Senate and the Democrats and Chuck Schumer as majority leader. But he also is vowing. Uh, Schumer, that Build Back Better is going to be passed, uh, that the Senate will pass the legislation before Christmas and it will get to the president's desk. And you and I talked about this the last time you were on. We all want that to happen. We hope that will happen, but it seemed like it was going to be very difficult (laughs) for that to happen. But he is saying it is going to happen. Talk a little bit about what's going on, because you write about how there's still the same problem of mansion and cinema. And cinema even went on CNN. It was almost as if she wasn't getting enough attention. Joe Manchin was getting all the attention because it seemed like she was on board too much. So she went on CNN to create some doubts again or something. Talk a little bit about what's going on. (laughs) That's exactly what she did last week. Um, There there was absolutely nothing of substance said in that interview. It was was very frustrating. But she did say, well, you know, maybe I'm not necessarily on board with this. And maybe I don't think that we should be trying to do it before Christmas. Which is what Manchin has been saying as well. Um, Schumer seems to be just sort of pushing anyway. He's got... All of the committees going to the Senate Parliamentarian and to the CBO, putting in their pieces of the legislation to have it scored, to have the Senate Parliamentarian go through it all and make sure that there aren't any problems in doing it as a budget reconciliation bill. So once all of the committees have finished that, it all comes together and they push it as one big bill in a votorama, which um, is as obnoxious as it sounds like it would be. (laughs) So, you know, he says the next two days we'll have all of these committees get their work done and get their bills through this process, and then it'll be ready to put together and push. And he's also telling his Democrats that they'll probably have to work weekends or weekend. This, This might be the last weekend. They were scheduled to go out for holiday recess next Monday. I'm pretty sure that's not going to be met. Um, But, you know, we could be looking at if if he gets his way midweek next week that they'll have everything done. Um, He's also saying he wants voting rights to be voted on before they leave. So I don't think he's going to get everything he wants (laughs) done done. but and build back Manchin, better, he could just try to steamroller it through. And one problem is in doing it too quickly and caving into Mansion too much, you wind up with a bill, particularly with the climate initiatives, that is then going to run into a problem with the House and what it just passed because it still has to conform with the House, and if you roll back some of these climate provisions, that's going to cause a lot of problems. Right. Um, A lot of them already had to hold their nose to vote for it in the House in terms of how much some of the climate provisions had been watered down. If they're watered down even further, then you're going to send this bill back to the House to pass again, and you're going to have more problems. It, it, It was a very, very tight vote both on um, tax provisions, on the stuff that got stripped out, like the Medicare expansion to include vision, dental, and hearing, um, the 12 weeks of parental leave, all of these things that ended up being truncated, um, I should say family and medical leave, that was included, but just at four weeks instead of the 12 weeks that everybody had been fighting for. 
in hopes that, yes, when it got over to the Senate side, four weeks would be enough of a compromise for Manchin to deal with as opposed to the 12 weeks. Well, he's saying no on that now. How much more stuff are they going to peel out of it for Joe Manchin? And right. what is the House going to be able to accept? Um, we don't know that right now. And they're making some noise back in hopes of, I think, um, getting Manchin on board or at least saying, hey, you've got to deal with this Manchin problem because you can't just dump this on us again. Right. We'll see. And then uh, I mean, there's I guess, Emma- I, it feels like it feels like Schumer is trying to push forward on this hard and fast in order to just sort of sweep the two of them along and not give them the opportunity to raise more objections. There's also immigration and the immigration part of this is, um, uh, you know, about the parliamentarian. It's a watered down provision. It doesn't have a path to citizenship, um, but it would give a temporary reprieve um, it, it, you know, in a decade of, of protection. Um, but the Senate parliamentarian weighs in and Democrats have to decide if they're just going to ignore what she has to say if they don't like it. Which is what, of course, Republicans would do if the parliamentarian came back with something that they didn't like, which she hasn't done in a while. Possibly because <laughs> there's the precedent of the parliamentarian being fired by Republicans for not doing what they want. Mm-hmm. Um, Democrats can certainly realize that Elizabeth McDonough, the Senate parliamentarian, is an employee of the Senate and serves at the pleasure of the majority leader, that her opinions are just opinions, they are advice. And they don't have to be considered law. So already they've given in way too much to what she said, narrowing this down from a path to citizenship to this, you know, 10 more years of essentially parole where they don't have to worry about being Mm -hmm. deported immediately, maybe. Um, But it's still, you know, another decade of uncertainty for them. It is certainly not what Democrats have been promising them for decades that they would get a path to citizenship. We're going to have to see what happens with that and everything else. And I'm sure we'll be talking about it again uh, before the end of the year. (laughs) And you'll be writing a lot about it. (laughs) Um, I will, because it's my most favorite time of the year. (laughs) (laughs) Joan, always great to have you on. Thanks so much for joining us today. You are most welcome. Talk to you probably next week. (laughs) Yes. Joan McCarter, uh, Daily Coast Senior Political Writer. Follow her on Twitter at Joan McCarter. We're back in a few minutes. This is the Michelangelo Seniorelli Show. Sirius XM 